kind of to, you know, um, you know, things that weren't very pleasant, but the education was, was excellent. Um, the color horse there with Joseph Albers, he had left, he fought with them about something. Um, so Cy Silman taught the color course and we took it with the architects and graphic designers. Um, Cy Silman was the name of the person who taught the course. And the Yale Museum, I saw the work of Ed Reinhardt and I really liked the close value color where you would have to really look at it for a long time before you saw the grid. Um, you know, the, the squares, but also the basic grid. Um, my teachers at BU were angry that I was accepted at Yale because they said I would stop being a figurative painter. And some of them, although many of them have passed away, but for years they would not speak to me. So, I mean, Yale, Yale was different, you know, just simply because it was before women were admitted except on the graduate level. So you saw very few uh, women and extremely, it's bad English, but very few uh, people of color, including Asian, Black, Latin American, or, or I should say Latino or, or Native American. So it was a very, it was like an ivory tower in the middle of a kind of destitute squalor of New Haven. Now New Haven's gotten much better. Um, it's a little bit, um, it doesn't, the divide is not as wide in terms of um, the economics. Although Yale is very heavily endowed, but um, New Haven does not look like a, you know, a town that's barely on its feet. Yeah. Okay. Um, as a recent graduate, I'm curious to know what from your time at school stayed with you in your practice, specifically if there were any artists or individuals who you met during this time who had a long lasting impact on your art. Well, Oh, that's a hard one. Um, during my time there, uh, there were visiting artists. Okay, we had John Cage, uh, Richard Lindner, <clears throat> Helen Frankenthaler. And the one of the issues was, well, Richard Lindner was really wonderful. He came to the studios, he spoke with the students, he wasn't judgmental. He shared what he thought without trying to kind of um, have an ego trip on you. Um, Cage, I didn't, I mean, I felt that I was not in his area of, of expertise, so I didn't invite him. Uh, and Helen Frankenthaler came to my studio and she saw I was, at the time I was still figurative, but I was moving towards abstraction. When she saw what I did, she basically said, I don't want to talk about this. This was done in the resident, in the Renaissance. And she walked away. But the students, they knew that she needed to see something that looked like hers, like her work. And so they kind of got together and would like um, do make pretend Helen Frankenthaler's and she just loved them. They got great critiques. So the students kind of all had some kind of falling out with her or at least disagreement. But if they gave her what she painted, then she was happy. Anyway, but I did get my revenge. Um, when I was at MoMA, I was sent as a liaison between the Whitney Museum and MoMA for a Helen Frankenthaler show. At that time, I was a curatorial. And when I showed up at her door, I thought she'd faint. And, but she had to kind of get used to the fact that <laughs> I was the one that was assigned to her show, even though she refused to look at my work. Yeah. Ardina, I'm, I'm showing some images just for our audience members um, to show an example of the work that you were doing at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, first, some of the early, more figurative work that you were working on during your time, really as an undergraduate at Boston mm -hmm. University, right. and how your work transitions as you go to Yale and you're yeah. pushed forward in a new direction. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, this is kind of the work that, that you were engaged in when you began your time at MoMA. Yes, yes. So as was just mentioned, you began working at the Museum of Modern Art in 1967. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious how your museum work affects your practice in any way. Well, I think the thing that it affected the most was the knowledge that you must use archival materials. Um, I worked basically, um, first I started off in the 
a circulating international and national exhibition department as a um, kind of curatorial assistant, it was called exhibition assistant. And then when the museum um, director passed away, there was a new director. And uh, I then went up to curatorial um, to drawings, prints, and illustrated books. Um, how can I explain it? I used the museum as a kind of visual library. You know, doing, I did my job, but on the day when, days when people were not admitted to the museum, I would go into the galleries and walk around. And the two artists that I was drawn to at that point, uh, Redon and Kandinsky. Uh, so I had both abstraction and something, you know, realistic. Um, and those days there were very few of any women on display at the museum uh, or any people of color. So it was, you know, it, it was just the same kind of maddening situation where uh, women and people of color were kept out of the basic dialogue. And if you criticized a white male artist, you were considered someone censoring them. Um, I did work in the Garvin collection at Yale as a graduate student. Uh, I did nothing important, but that was my little toe into museum work. Um, and the person that helped me, um, uh, Jules Brown, who was my art history teacher, and I had art history as my minor, uh, but he was willing to endorse me when the museum was considering hiring me. Yeah. Um, on April 30th, MoMA announced that it would be terminating all contracted educator positions in light of the coronavirus pandemic. And they released a statement saying, it will be months, if not years, before we anticipate returning to budget and operation levels to require educator services. As an artist and former employee at MoMA, I'm curious about your thoughts of the importance of museum education in general, as well as, as in the light of the post-pandemic world we will be experiencing museums through. Well, I'll tell you, it's the first time I heard about it and it broke my heart. I really feel bad that this is happening. Uh, Ann Timken, who's the chief curator, was the first curator to truly acknowledge diversity and she integrated the collection uh, in terms of women and people of color in the main galleries. Um, I remember uh, Mel Edwards' work was being shown with Jackie Windsor's work. Um, uh, Faith Ringgold's work was being shown with Picasso. She integrated the collection and to see that they would cut off their education services is heartbreaking. I must say it, it made me really sad. I, I really mourn the loss of uh, education services. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm also curious about how you, in your own work, made a transition from figurative work into abstract using objects like the hole punch and then using uh, material like talcum powder. Um, so if you could if you want to speak on well, that. Well, yeah, it was a slow transition. Mainly it was because I was working during the day and I was used to having um, a, a natural light. And of course I was indoors during that time. Um, so I decided to kind of play. And I remember seeing um, Ed Reinhardt in terms of close value colors. And then um, there was a, um, one of the students was playing around with circles and it kind of, I don't know, it just hit me. And I had a memory from when I was growing up of being with my father. Um, uh, we went into Kentucky, we were visiting my mother's uh, uh, family. And so while my mother was with her sisters, my father and I went into Kentucky um, and my father liked root beer. So we went to a root beer stand and they served us mugs with red circles under them. And um, I asked my father what this meant. And my father said that these are about segregation. Only black people can use this particular mug, that whites would not use the same mug. And so I always say to people, I was frightened by a circle. Um, and it's like, I'm kind of working out that fear by using circles. But then of course, when we look at the universe, the sun is circular, the earth is circular, moon is circular, it's kind of a basic uh, geometric form um, in terms of uh, mother nature. So, um, and I'm not sure how it happened, the punching of the dots, 
but you see the template that's there. What I did is I started um, taking file folders, putting them in strips, punching them, gluing them together, and then I put a kind of a buffer of plastic. So when I sprayed paint through it, it would not um, bleed onto the rest of the painting. But I never threw out the, the punch dots. And that's when I started using them uh, for drawing, for three-dimensional drawing. Um, I don't know. I, it just happened. I, I, yeah, I, you know, I was doing all of this numbering. I saved the dots and I was using a, um, I can't remember what kind of pen it was called, um, a rapidograph. And I would just sit for hours with a, a needle or a pin or something to hold down one dot. And I individually, um, I numbered them before I put them on the grid, the paper grid, graph paper grid. Um, another, thing that, oh, another thing that comes to mind when I'm looking at your material and your work um, in light of the current pandemic is the accumulation of such small bits of material, um, like you have these punch dots and then the clingy glitter, um, which are often caught in threads or, or embedded within an, the acrylic layer of your paintings. Um, and it kind of reminds me of this, like the hard to control spread of um, an invisible hold of viruses that is so often on our minds now. Um, and I'm curious if you can speak to that in your work or just different relationships you're thinking about with your material. I didn't, you know, know anything about the virus then, but it is strange. You know, you kind of think about the way things are stuck together in, in my work, the way they're clustered. Um, also, the way, I don't know whether, because if you see the uh, virus on uh, TV, it's very colorful. And I don't know if that's its natural coloration or if graphic designers made it colorful. Anyway, so it's kind of artistic the way they present the virus. Like I think it has like red little round things and then I can't remember what the this basic sphere had uh, in terms of color. Um, I just, it's kind of spooky, you know, that the clustering sort of looks like what they show you in terms of when it kind of goes to a part of the body and starts uh, destroying it. Um, but of course I did this many, many, many years ago in the seventies. So um, there was no, well, I grew up during the polio epidemic uh, back in the forties and fifties. Um, fortunately, um, the worst I got was a strep throat, but one of my friends did, did get polio, but it affected him in terms of swallowing. He had a hard time swallowing. Yeah. Um, you've spoken about how the circle has special significance in your work. I'm curious about other geometric forms or symbols that bring together the personal political through abstraction or have different layers of resonance to you. Um, well, I don't know if I would call this um, geometric, but I use a lot of arrows. Um, and usually it's arrows with numbers. Um, I'm, in fact, there's another painting I'm starting to work on where I'm using the arrow part, not the stem, not the uh, stick part of the arrow. So I'm using like these sort of angular shapes. Um, and my, my paintings actually, I usually worked in a rectangular way, but then when I moved, I lived in Japan for seven months on one of the uh, NEA's uh, grants. And after that, my paintings became circular or irregular um, in terms of the ge geometry of the outside of the painting. Um, I just saw some things in Kabuki that had to do with the color, so my colors changed. And there was just something about being there and what I saw, the culture was amazing. Um, where I started making things irregular and also really explored a different palette. Um, since Hannah and I are both now leaving the structured community of a university, I'm curious to know your advice on where to find or maintain artistic and critical conversations outside of an educational institution. Well, frankly, I would encourage you both to stay in touch, maybe FaceTime. One of the things that you can do, because a lot of the museums, both here and abroad, are doing virtual tours of their collection. Um, and art galleries, too, are doing virtual um, views. 
I would say try to stay in touch with people. Um, I had this actually on my notes uh, later, but I suggest something I can do as a day page so that I can keep up with what's going on in my life because what's happening now in the outside is so overwhelming to be able to write it down so you don't cling to it. Um, just, you know, the fact that the president is building a wall around the White House. I mean, this, it's just so many things. Uh, there was a 75-year-old um, a, a uh, white fellow who the police pushed to the ground. Some of you may have seen the video and it must have cracked his skull because he was bleeding. And um, thank goodness someone was there to video it. And then um, one of the policemen came by and tried to help him and his supervisor pushed him away and, and left the guy on the ground. Um, you know, there's so much happening now that um, in quarantine or whatever, holding that in without being able to talk to people, um, I think can be very depressing. So I would suggest um, you try uh, having FaceTime and you talk to your friends, but be careful of privacy issues. If there's any sense of invasion, don't continue uh, that particular call. Also, I've been warned about on your, uh, on your uh, computer to put tape over the camera when you're using it just in your everyday whatever, so no one can see you. Um, but in other words, um, how can I explain it? The isolation can be depressing. Um, try to reach out to each other, email. Uh, I'm cautious with Zoom because we had a really ugly thing happen at my university during graduation. Someone uh, hacked in and sent these amazingly horrific um, pornographic images. They were awful. So it was a real kind of traumatizing. So you don't want that. But try to keep in touch with one another. Do the day page. And also keep a journal in terms of your ideas as an art historian, what you like to write about or research or and as an artist. Keep a kind of visual journal of the ideas that you have. Um, looking back on your past work, um, I was wondering if you could tell us some, a little bit of what it was like to be a co-founder of the AIR Gallery, which was the first women's cooperative gallery in the country. Uh, yes, uh, there was a kind of basic group, I don't know whether it was four or five women, that went around to slide registries looking at women, and I was in a slide registry at Artist Space which was at that time under Irving Sandler. Um, and they saw my slides and they invited me to be part of the co-op. And so we ended up with 20 of us. And I remember we had a meeting where we named the uh, co-op and I'm the one who actually named it AIR, starting off with Jane Eyre and then I thought Eyre. And then of course the, a number of buildings in Soho at the time had AIR on the building so that the, pol not police, but the fire department knew there were people living in the building, even if they were not legal. So um, there was a certain amount of bickering within the group. Uh, one of the problems was you had um, people who were married and were financially comfortable. And so they had a lot more free time. And that was hard for the people who had a job. So um, it just got a little bit too stressful. So I only stayed about three years, but I was part of the group that built the gallery or renovated, I should say, the gallery on, I believe we were on Worcester Street. It was 97 Worcester, I may be wrong. It's been so many years. Um, and then Anna Mandietta, after I left, uh, became a member of the gallery. And now I think they have two African-Americans and I think they have some Asian artists. They've lasted all these years, which I find incredible. Yeah. Howard, you know, we're looking right now on the screen at a work that I believe you made when you were with AIR. Is that correct? It's the kind of the stretch oh, grid, yeah. the free hanging grid, uh, which was a pivotal piece in your practice. What's, I don't even remember the date of it. 
Oh, I believe it's 70s. It has a, I think it's 76. Uh, so I had left the gallery by then. I don't know. I, I had left the gallery. Or maybe so. It's early 70s, I think. Um, but this is like a really amazing uh, leap in your practice where you go from working like we saw those really, um, you know, uh, intimate punched dot works that were done often on scraps of uh, kind of recycled materials that you yeah. were able to barter for at MoMA. Yeah. And you're working on paintings, as we saw, you know, in the upstairs gallery at the Rose, we're looking at installation photos yes. of your work at the, at the Rose Art Museum, um, you know, can, that were stretched, framed in a more traditional fashion. And here you do this amazing thing where you play with the grid, which I know that you were thinking of much during your time at MoMA, and you, you ha create this amazing sculptural work. And I wonder if you could talk about that move to the unstretched canvas and how it kind of centers on this grid in particular? Well, I think part of my movement to unstretched had a lot to do with African textiles. Uh, I had written a piece for a show. It was a catalog somewhere near the UN, a show of African adornments. And even though I did, I worked with, um, you know, sort of um, not bracelets, but um, wearable adornments, um, I became aware, and also the modern had a show about African art um, of unstretched or free flowing fabric. I think that would be the word for it. Um, so I started kind of being more playful. And um, I also found that there was so much attention on the grid, our attention to the grid. And I decided to kind of make a little fun of it. So I call this my portable grid that you could carry it anywhere. Um, it's about 12 by 12 feet and I took strips of canvas, sewed them, stuffed them with I probably foam and I used grommets that you would use. Uh, either I used shower curtain, but I think these are grom grommets with rings. And I think the rings at the time you bought to make a kind of loose leaf book. Um, and you literally, you know, you just fold it up and put it in the corner or you can hang it up loosely. It was just, it was kind of a joke. Um, you know, I just, I wanted to smile because sometimes things are not that great. <laughs> Anyhow, so that's kind of the basic backstory on, on the uh, portable grid. And, you know, I think throughout your practice, we see that you're always pushing at the boundaries or the assumed boundaries of the art world or what painting could be. And here you actually literally pushed at the boundaries of our own walls as well yeah. at the Rose and that we had to build a wall um, that was yeah. large enough to accommodate this grid. But um, yes, we loved living with this piece for the time that it was at the museum. Oh, okay. One other work that I wanted to just focus a little bit on is Free White in 21 which was, I believe, your first video work. And it's actually one yeah. of the few video works that you've made. Um, yet for many individuals, and myself included, this video is the first encounter that they have with your practice. And it's a work that tragically, um, as I mentioned in our, in our introduction, continues to be incredibly relevant in contemporary conversations about inequity and racism in the United States. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the process of making this video and also the events and the shifts in your life that surrounded it. Okay, well, I did Free White in 21. Uh, it was like my reaction to the women's movement. Um, there, was a, there was racism in the women's movement. Um, I was introduced to the movement by Lucy Bacard, who when I went to the Modern was the, the visiting curator who I worked with to produce a traveling show at that point. That's why I kind of more in the whole education stance now, where they would send shows from the collection, small shows, to uh, art galleries at universities. And um, that program was stopped when the director, um, he died, he was hit by a car. And the new director did he discontinued that department. Um, anyway, so my reaction to the women's movement, and I would you know, kind of get on their nerves about why aren't you, aren't you, first of all, where are the women of color in the movement? And why aren't you dealing with these issues of, of in, not inclusion, but um, rejection by the art world at large? Um, and it kind of, well, the first time it was shown, Anna Min and Diet did a show at uh, AIR called The Dialectics of Isolation. And um, 
she had a nice little catalog. Uh, it was the first time that this, uh, my video was shown. And then um, Franklin Furness asked me if I would, you know, do a program, if I would, could show the tape there. I agreed to it. And um, they wanted to charge people, I don't know how much money to go in. I said, just take my honorarium and let people in for free. Why should they pay all this for a 12 minute tape? And people were shaken by it. They were very, very upset with me. Um, the women, of course, were upset, but um, the, the um, white art world was not happy with what I was implicating, or at least they didn't want to know about it. Um, now I have a, 25 years later, I have a new video. In the interim, I did do a video, which was a... We've lost Howard Dana. Let's hope that she comes back. Sorry, everyone, little technical difficulties. This for Howard Dina was a new thing, the attempt to, to do a conversation on Zoom. So I know that she does have a tech with her. So um, if we can all just have a quick pause, I'll work to get Howard Dina back on the line. Just one moment. And we're back. <laughs> Howardina is just connecting to audio, so we'll just take a minute. There you are, Howardina. Oh, you're back. Oh my God. I know. I want my mask. <laughs> it's always something with these with this new technology that we're engaged in. Um, well, thank you so much for struggling with the computer to rejoin us. We're really appreciative that you're back in this space with us. Um, and I think just in the interest of time, since we're now at an hour since we started, I'm going to have our two interns just ask uh, two final questions. Um, okay. Hannah and, and then Emma. Um, and then at that point, uh, my colleague Elizabeth Moy, our programs coordinator, has been looking at your many questions that you've sent our way as an audience, and um, we'll do our best to, to move through a few of those as well. Um, so Hannah, you had a question about quarantine in particular. Yeah. Um, so Howard, Dina, I'm curious if you have any suggestions about maintaining a studio practice in quarantine. Um, you know, looking for inspiration or material. I know you mentioned journaling before, which I found really interesting. Yeah, journaling is, is, is pretty important, I think, because like I'm old, you know, and it's nice to look at a visual journal that's dated. And so I know, oh my God, I had that idea 10 years ago. Uh, I'm gonna take off this, uh, maybe I shouldn't take off the mask. But anyway, um, I'm going to be working on my memoir. And so, um, at 77, uh, as your memory gets a little bit thin, <laughs> it's good to write down. I, actually, I want to learn from Brian talking into the computer and having the computer type it out. Now, in terms of the, uh, the virus, one of the things that my students loved, one of the assignments I gave them was to do a virtual museum tour. You can go to museums all over the world and see their collections. So you can, even if you're, it's an armchair traveler kind of um, a, a approach, but that's one thing during the pandemic you can do is learn about collections in other parts of the world. Um, and they were very excited about the uh, assignment because someone had never been to Europe, uh, but uh, I can't remember which museums uh, they viewed. I believe, I believe the Met probably has a virtual tour of the collection. And art galleries also are giving virtual tours of their shows. Probably it's the show that was on when the uh, pandemic closed everything down. Um, don't isolate. When I say don't isolate, I would just try to stay in touch with your friends. Be cautious with um, uh, media and you know social media because you don't know who's hacking. You don't know whatever. Um, but still try to stay in touch. Don't be alone a day after day after day without reaching out to people to see how they're doing. And they'll be interested to know how you're doing. Okay. Um, it's also a good time to, if you have anyone you wish you had called, call them. Or anyone you wish you had written, write them. Now, I do have three assistants. Um, Brian's one of them. And I have two studio assistants so they can take my mail to the post office and so forth. But one of the latest 
things that's very upsetting is Trump wants to shut down the post office. So there are elderly people who get medicine. Fortunately, I don't get my medicine that way. Um, social security checks, uh, unemployment checks, you know, whatever. And I'm hoping it's something that he will not do, but he's been threatening and he has put into place one of his allies as the new post uh, master general. So that may slow down reaching out to people by mail, but also slows down you're getting your bills and you're paying your bills. So it's, it, it's kind of a frightening time. Um, again, please reach out. And if you have a good relationship with your family, reach out to them because they are also probably suffering. That's a basic way of handling it. Howard, Dina, I'm thinking about how you're, you're giving so much great advice about reaching out. And yet at the same time, over the past decades, we've seen you uh, find such invention within the confines of your studio practice, whether it's reusing the punch dots that you, you saved from the, fr the first templates you made, or even I showed some images of them earlier, but um, your video drawings, which was uh, you know, really something that you, you took a TV into your studio to keep you company. Yeah. And from that experience of being in your studio, you were one of the first, the first to really use television as an artistic medium in that way. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, no need to answer now, no pressure. We've seen that you know, the technology, uh, there's many hurdles with technology during this moment of yeah. war, but perhaps despite our struggles with Zoom, you'll end up creating a totally new work from this. I, I don't know. I'm um, with the Shed Show, which will, oh, that's where we left off. In terms of my video, I have a new video that I've already completed. It's called Fire Water Rope or Fire Rope Water. Um, it's, a, it's pretty grim. It's about lynching. It's about slavery and the timing of it now, especially. Um, and then um, it's about the Children's March in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I also, during, I'm doing two paintings for the show about colonialism and then another one about the burning down of black towns and uh, black churches. So that's kind of like a heavy duty show that was supposed to open this October, but of course with the pandemic, they're, they've changed the time again. They were gonna do it in January, but now I think it'll probably end up being fall of 21. 2021. Anyway, so video I find reaches out to more people because it's portable. You can mail it, whatever. Uh, it's pretty inconspicuous uh, and it's not like having people drag themselves to a museum to see your work or to a gallery uh, and you get your message across. So that's something that I have coming up in, in the future. And it's something that can be shown, uh, it can be shown on your laptop, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very, it's a gruesome, it's a gruesome book. Um, one more question. Over these past few months, museums, galleries, and artists have echoed a similar rallying point, which is that we need art more, sorry, we need art more than ever now. To you, what does this really mean? And how do you think that we, as artists and museum professionals, can ensure that the public can access art in a meaningful way in times of crisis? Well, the issue there is how do you reach out to someone who you don't know? Um, and I don't know if social media might be one way of doing it, but I'm just at 77, I. I'm really a dunce when it comes to technology, uh, but there may be some way, like there are groups, like there is a group, I'm on their um, lister for animal rights and they have a huge you know, list of people. And I don't know how one reaches out when you don't know who to reach out to unless maybe a group could be formed and then they could formulate some way of getting out using technology to people in general to let them know that there are certain things that are available for them online in terms of artistic practice. Now, um, I've noticed that there have been some artists uh, online that I don't know, um, but it, it's a tough one. I think 
people who are more sophisticated about technology would be able to answer that question because I think that's the only way. But then that becomes a class issue because some people do not, cannot afford a computer. Now, if they can afford a cell phone, it's possible that they can see these images on a cell phone, on a smartphone. Uh, I've had for 14 years a flip phone and I really resisted a smartphone and now I'm very glad I got it because I can text people, you know, I can reach out to people. So I think that's a tough question for someone in my generation. I think uh, a younger person might know ways of creating a group, uh, a way of attracting people, hopefully not bad people, um, to then share your images with them. Now, there are copyright issues too. When you do that, how do you know if someone is going to copy you or not? So it's, you know, you have to also protect yourself. So I, I don't know, I don't know the way of creating a group online and knowing that that group is safe. Because privacy issues with um, social media are really big. You have to be very careful. Yeah. Regina, I think that um, in classic fashion, you're being too modest. And um, th there is an entire generation, there'll be more generations who continue to look to your work and to your practice and what you've done yeah. as an example to follow. Um, yeah. And despite the media that you choose, your work is incredibly resonant, incredibly powerful. And I believe it's what we need uh, for this moment and for the moments to come. Right. So with that, I wanna uh, turn the, the screen, I should say, over to my colleague, Elizabeth Moy, um, who's our programs coordinator here at the Rose Art Museum. And Elizabeth has been working through all of those very many questions you've sent. So we're going to answer a few, um, and then unfortunately we'll have to depart for the afternoon. But Elizabeth. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, and thank you so much, Howardina, for um, this wonderful opportunity to just hear your thoughts about your career and also um, the moment that we're in now. And thank you to everybody that sent all of your questions. Um, we're definitely doing our best to go through them all and, um, and answer them as best we can, both um, offline and um, online right now. Um, I love that, um, I love hearing about the new work that you're creating, the video work, um, Howardina, and sort of how it's um, it, even more resonant now than ever. And I think there's a lot of questions around um, around how we sort of, uh, how artists grapple with recent events. And we have one particular question um, from an attendee um, that writes, with recent events, what do you see for the future of contemporary art, specifically with contemporary arts engagement with black artists? Will there be real progress or have you been here too many times before? Well, I feel really sad about the modern, you know, stepping back in terms of educational services because that's going to reach a lot of people and now it won't. Um, I just, I don't know, it distresses me a lot. Um, I don't know how to quite answer the question. Ask me the question again, okay? Sure. Um, hold on one second. Um, with recent events, what do you see for the future for contemporary art, specifically with contemporary arts engagement with black artists? Will there be real progress or have you been here too many times before? Okay, all right, I wrote it down. I think, all right, I think because of what's happened, there'll be more African-American, Native American. In fact, my own uh, gallery has now four Native American artists. I think it's three or four. Um, and two black artists. Um, but anyway, I think that there'll be a lot of people's consciousness raised as a result of the death of George Floyd, because I'm, I'm very impressed um, by the number of whites who have shown up to protest. Um, and also they're seeing firsthand some of the inequities and the behavior um, of both the president and the behavior of uh, the police firsthand, they're seeing this. So I think that the future will not be as limiting towards people of color uh, and women as it might have been had this not happened, okay? Because the pandemic in a way 
could possibly roll the clock back, but it can't with what's happening because people are starting to see literally firsthand what African-Americans have been talking about for a long time. There was an image last night on TV that was very upsetting. There was a white man about 75 and the police, it wasn't curfew as an issue, not at all. He just went up to a policeman to ask a question and the policeman shoved him. He fell and hit his head and he started bleeding. And one of the police officers walking by bent over to help him and his supervisor stopped him. Now he is apparently now in the hospital, this elderly man. For whites to see what the police, this is white against white, can do. And then of course you take it further, what would that same person do to someone of color? So I think there is a certain amount of consciousness raising within this particular moment. Uh, but again, I'm upset about the modern because to reach out with educational services with the kind of power MoMA has, and then to cut that off at a time when they have diversified their galleries is really depressing. Thank you, Howard Dina. Um, so I had um, actually a follow-up question that I, I think is pretty interesting in terms of um, the question is really the role of um, activism in your art. Um, and if there really is a difference between art and activism. Uh, well, I think there is a difference. Uh, I do two different kinds of art. I do abstract art as a kind of relief from the other. Um, and I had started, I'd say Free White and 21 was the first activist piece, but there was something before I, beforehand that I did on plexiglass that I have no idea where it is. But after being in the car accident, I, had a, I was in a passenger in a car going to school and I sustained a concussion. And after that, you know, my feelings were, you know, I may be dead tomorrow. I'd rather get my opinion out there rather than just doing abstract work. So, and I was also, but I didn't react to the pressure within the black community. Abstract black artists were, were kind of ostracized because they said we were not doing work that um, helped anyone. Um, but then I started doing work that had to do with issues like women's issues, um, people of color issues. Um, this would be the accent was 79. And after that, you start to see work that is very, very specific to my belief system. I just, you know, I just didn't see that it was right for me to not do uh, work that express my opinion when I knew things were not good. And even though I was writing at that point, uh, that writing was getting published, you only reach a, a, a fair amount of people, or at least you, you, meet, you reach some people and some reach, um, sometimes you reach people through your paintings, but more likely it also be through your um, likely video because it's portable. Um, and possibly through the writing. Yeah, my, in fact, my publisher does, just died the other day, uh, Cynthia Navarrete. She had cancer, but she lasted a long time and she did die peacefully at home. But she was one of the first publishers for um, uh, women writers and artists. Um, she did a very major a book about African women artists called Gumbo Yaya. Uh, she was someone very modest who she'd been giving numerous awards and she turned them all down. She wouldn't accept them. Uh, and she, she's a great loss. Um, she was quite elderly, uh, but I'm glad she passed peacefully because she did have cancer, but she, she just died, I guess, of natural causes. Thank you, Howard Dina. Um, I, we have another question here that I think is uh, interesting. Um, that speaks to a little bit more specifically to your process, but I think it's relevant in terms of just what's going on right now and um, uh, especially um, also with the pandemic. And so the question is, um, um, could Howard Dina speak to the tremendous amount of time it has taken you um, to make your works comprised of thousands of tiny elements? 
Were you working with a sense of meditativeness or contemplation as you sat for hours attaching tiny pieces? And could you share how you're able to freely enter such a state of deep focus? And does this require any mental preparation? That's interesting. Yeah, I used to meditate a lot. But meditation is problematic because you can also hurt your brain if you meditate too much. Um, I enjoy writing numbers. My father was a mathematician, so I saw him writing numbers. Um, anyway, I, it's, it's for me almost a kind of personal meditation. I might do that while I'm watching TV. Um, I haven't numbered any circles for a long time, but at the time there is a certain amount of peace that I feel, and I think also it helps. I'm gonna take the mask off, I'm suffocating. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, gee, these things are hot. <laughs> We've been taking precautions because Howardina does have assistance in her studio with her today, so we want to be extra careful. Yeah, I have to be careful. Um, now, what was I saying? Oh, meditation. Um, I enjoy writing numbers, and for me, it's drawing. It's not about being able to add them or subtract them. I'm terrible in terms of mathematics. I mean, I, my checkbook is a mess. You know, I, I'm not really that good at um, using numbers for functional purpose. I mainly like to write them. Now, I haven't numbered dots in a while. I have a piece of rice paper on the wall here that has a grid. It's quite large, and I was going to start numbering um, dots of rice paper but I just haven't gotten it to it yet. Um, hmm. I think, yeah, meditation I'm careful with because there was a woman named um, Margaret Singer who researched meditation and its effects. And she said people should not meditate because it can affect the brain adversely. Yeah, especially people who like intensely, you know, go to retreats and spend hours meditating. You can really hurt your head, yeah. So uh, that's just my advice, be cautious. Elizabeth, I think we can maybe take like one more question um, and then we'll have to sadly close for the afternoon. Okay, this is tough. There's so many wonderful questions um, and I apologize in advance. We haven't been able to get to all of them. Um, we do have a question from uh, someone from the Brandeis community here um, asking, um, She's been researching Afro-Asian cultural exploration among African-American artists and would love to hear more about your experience in Japan, um, which uh, she knows was marked by aesthetic inspiration as well as racism. Um, as we think about cross-racial solidarity, especially within the art world, how can we find the generative space within these uncomfortable encounters and reckon with them? That's a tough one. Uh, I lived in Japan for seven months. It was an NEA, um, Bunkacho, Bunkacho, I guess is their cultural section of the Japanese go government. And I ran into a lot of racism. Uh, and then women are not treated very nicely there. Um, but the culture, the visual culture, especially the ancient culture is mind blowing. It's extraordinary. Um, but I, you know, there were a lot of times that people would try and it would be silliness. I mean, this little boy, I remember I was going to, to um, a temple. Uh, there was mushiboshi, or sh they call it shaking out of the bugs. And um, this child ran up to me to kick me because they're very xenophobic. They don't like foreigners. But his shoe flew off, thank goodness. And so in a sense, he lost face. But his mother was with him when she saw him do that. And so when he couldn't kick me, she said, oh, so you sent which means, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, there was one um, person who was there from California, Bruce uh, Schwartz, who was a very talented puppeteer. He had done a MacArthur when he was 28. And he would go to Kabuki, Kabuki every day. And there was this one young woman who tried to, he was like six feet something. She tried to push him down the stairs. Um, you know, she saw him as an unwanted foreigner. So, I mean, I just had to, well, I don't know, just have the toughest skin possible and go around and do um, what I needed to do. Um, 
and to also see as much as I could see um, because I would not be getting that opportunity again. And I, after what I went through there, I didn't want to go back. Even though after I left, there was a show of African-American art and they paid our way and all. I wouldn't go. The work went, but I didn't go. Um, I don't know how we can heal those ba uh, ba boundaries or, or barriers. I, you know, I don't know how you heal that, especially during the pandemic, because there is no, we can't go there, they can't come here. Um, the only connection would then be on the web you know, uh, Zoom or uh, FaceTime or whatever. Um, I don't know. I mean, that was in 19, um, I was there in 81, 82. Um, I don't know. It was a tough trip. I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> I don't see how one mends, um, you know, where the society has such a deep rooted a xenophobic and also they were anti Semitic, um, they were racist and sexist. So I, you know, it was a tough seven months. I was angry most of the time, <laughs> but anyway, I mean, maybe after the pandemic, uh, there can be like, cause right now we can't have exhibitions going back and forth. That, you know, cuts off that dialogue. Uh, one could perhaps uh, look at the website for the J Japan Society here in New York to see what if they have any programming that you can look at. Um, but no, I found it to be a tough trip. I wouldn't want to go through it again. Yeah. Um, thank you again. That was that was not a uh, quite not a softball question. That's for sure. Um, I was thinking that maybe we might um, take one more question that I do think relates to um, sort of where we are now and how we can sort of open up space. Um, a uh, much more equitable space. And, you know, one of the question was um, sort of looking back at your career um, uh, with AIR, AIR Gallery and, you know, do you have any advice that you might give, um, you know, budding uh, curators and artists that are looking to start their own space um, now, today? Well, the thing is, it's gonna have to be a virtual space. Today, there's no way you're gonna be able to physically move work around. So I don't know if you can uh, start like a chain you know, where one artist recommends another artist recommends another artist and then get that group together and share your work. That may be the only way you can do it, you know. Um, I think it's safer when you have one artist you trust to pass it on to another artist that uh, she or he trusts um, rather than just opening it up wide to the general public, you know. Uh, and also Zoom is an issue. You have to be careful of Zoom because it can be hacked. Um, I don't know, it's such a difficult time for all of us, you know, and for people who are poor. And I mean, being able to social distance is a privilege. There are many countries where, and places here where people can't social distance and they get sick. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a tricky one, but I think if you have a chain uh, of people who pass it on and they pass it on to someone else they know, that way you might be able to build a group where you can trust everyone. Well, thank you, Howard Dina, um, yeah. for joining us for this time. And during, as you've mentioned, a very, a very hard time within our, our history, within our own lives. And hopefully it's a pivotal moment that we can yeah. work change together. Yeah. Um, and really, we want to thank you for allowing us to learn from your practice, for sharing so generously with us, and really congratulate you on your accomplishments. Thank um, you. It's such a well-deserved honorary doctorate that uh, Brandeis is awarding you. Um, yeah. And to Emma and Hannah, you know, congratulations to you as well. I know this has been a very tough, unexpected end to your time at Brandeis. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to spend more time together, but I, I appreciate you being part of this conversation. Um, and to all of you who attended and stuck with us, thank you. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but I have even more admiration for those of you who stayed on to the end. Um, it's been a pleasure to spend time with you in this way. And I hope that we might see you again. We do have some upcoming programs, um, also virtual programs at the Rose later this month. 
Um, over the next two weeks, we'll be hosting programs uh, related to Dora Garcia's exhibition at the Rose Art Museum with an online film screening and then a panel discussion and book launch. Details about those, uh, those different programs will be posted very soon. So I hope we see you again. And until then, uh, be safe and be well. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.